Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, and away we go with number four. So uh, let's turn quickly to Matthew chapter 25. And I'm going to stay on this theme for just a little bit yet that everything here in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, yes, even John, is still predominantly, I won't say exclusively, but predominantly directed to the nation of Israel. Because, you see, the church as we know it, the body of Christ, is kept secret in the mind of God. And that's the word you have to get used to. It was a secret. It's part of the mysteries. Now, in order for it to be a secret, it stands to reason that you can't let any part of it slip out or it's no longer a secret. Isn't that right? Now then, what I want you to watch for, and for those of you studying now on television, and just check me out. Don't take my word for anything. But go back through the gospel accounts and see if Jesus ever gives any hint of turning to the Gentiles and calling out a Gentile body for himself. Well, you won't find it. Now, I know the closest somebody will come. Well, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, even that statement. I do not think that Jesus was specifically referring to the church as we know it because the word ecclesia, from which the word church is always translated, the word ecclesia is used in different manners and ways than just the church, the body of Christ. For example, <clears throat> uh, Stephen, in that chapter 7 that we referred to earlier this afternoon, he refers to the children of Israel out in the wilderness around Sinai as the church in the wilderness. Well now, good heavens, the church wasn't back there, was it? No. So what was he really saying? That called out assembly in the wilderness. Now, you see, that makes sense, because that's what Israel was. They were called out of Egypt, God assembled them around Mount Sinai, and so they were an ecclesia. And it's called the church in the wilderness. No, that's not the church. That's not the body of Christ. Now, believe it or not, when we get to the book of Acts, I'm going to show you where a riotous mob in the city of Ephesus was also called an ecclesia. But the translators didn't call it church there, fortunately. <laughs> they called it an assembly. See? And it was an unlawful assembly. It was a riotous assembly. And it was mob rule. But it was called an ecclesia in the Greek. And so you always have to be careful that just because it's the word church, it doesn't automatically follow that it's the body of Christ because Paul almost always qualifies our present day church as the body of Christ, which is the church. Or he'll say the church, which is his body. And so that makes a big difference. All right, so what I'm going to show you here in just a moment now is that Jesus never, never gave a hint and he did not reveal a part of that secret. Now here is, I think, the perfect illustration of that in Matthew 25, verse 31. And again, he's speaking. And he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. He's speaking of the second coming. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now here's another good example of what I'm always saying. Ask questions. Ask yourself a question. Who is coming with him? Angels. Now my next question is, where am I? Where am I? He isn't including me. He's just talking about angels. You see that? Why? Oh, because he couldn't mention the church here yet. It was still a secret. And so he was meticulous. And he left the church out. Now, just to show you that the church indeed is going to come with him, now turn back to Revelation. We looked at these verses several months ago when we were in the book of Revelation. But now in Revelation 19, we get the clue. Indeed, we're going to be with him. 
And just because Jesus left it out in Matthew doesn't mean we won't be. It just means he wasn't revealing the secret. Revelation 19, drop down to verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8, And to her, that is the bride, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of whom? The saints, the believers. Now I'll pick it up in the same chapter and come all the way over to oh, verse 11. Here is the second coming in all of its glory and his power as he's descending now from heaven. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Indeed he will. He's going to destroy the armies of this world. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So who is it? It's Christ. Now verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, Compare that with the other verse. Who are they? The saints. See? So sure, we're going to be coming with him. But he couldn't reveal that back in his earthly ministry. That was part of the secret. And so you'll find that throughout all the gospel accounts, there's never a reference to the body of Christ, the saved of the Gentiles. It's all still basic to the covenants made with Israel. And just like I said so often, if people would just read and read and read and read, study these things, and you'll see that what everybody thinks is in there isn't. The Gospels just do not contain it. And I think this is why the church is in such a dilemma tonight. And I say the church, I'm not talking about any one denomination, is because, as my class people have told me over and over, 90 to 95 percent of the church preaching and teaching is coming from the four Gospels. And they're missing the boat, see? Not that you ignore the Gospels. Oh, heaven forbid. I love to teach them. But you see, our basic doctrine for salvation, oh, now let me show you a verse in Peter. See, that? that's the way I teach. I can't help that. Uh, come back to Peter, 1 Peter. 2 Peter, I mean. 2 Peter. Just come back from Revelation, and just a few pages to the left, and you get 2 Peter. And here he's writing just shortly before he's martyred. And again, get the chronology. Christ was crucified in about 29 A.D. Stephen was martyred about seven years later, 36. The very next year, you have Saul converted, which would be 37. Then in next year, 38 A.D., you've got Peter going to the house of Cornelius. And uh, then you come on the way up to about A.D. 60. Paul writes the book of Romans. And then about 64, 65, he writes the other epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And then about 67, somewhere in there, <clears throat> just before he's martyred, he writes Timothy and Titus. And so does Peter write his little epistles towards the end of their life. And that will all be just shortly before the temple is destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. So we're coming right up close to that now. And so just shortly before Peter is martyred, and Paul as well, Peter writes. And of course he's writing to Jews, just like James, primarily to the nation of Israel. But look what he says in verse 15 of 2 Peter 3. And account, latch on to it, that the long suffering or the patience of our Lord is what? Salvation. Salvation. See, that's the whole purpose of this book. From cover to cover, the whole purpose of this book is to bring lost humanity to a knowledge of salvation. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come 
to a knowledge of salvation. See? And so Peter again is reiterating that, that the whole scope of God's patience is to bring the man that is lost to a place of salvation. All right, read on. So the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And now remember who's writing this. Peter, by inspiration of the same spirit, of course, even as our beloved brother Paul. Well, that's kind of hard to comprehend because, you see, the last account we have between Peter and Paul, what was it? It was a confrontation. Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, I withstood him to the face. Why? Because he was to be blamed. And what was Peter's problem? He just couldn't recognize that he was no longer under the law and that he was free now to eat with Gentiles, to converse with Gentiles. It still bothered him, see? And in Galatians chapter 2, it was so, such a bother to him that even though he was visiting the Gentile church at Antioch and evidently had been going in and eating with those Gentiles, just as soon as some Jews came up from Jerusalem, what did Peter do? He withdrew because he was afraid of what the Jews might say. Hey, this is real. These are normal people. And Peter was not yet that convinced that Paul was on the right track. Now look what he says. By inspiration, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles. Got that? Romans through Hebrews. That's Paul's epistles. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, salvation, in which, Paul's epistles, are some things hard to be understood. Now, people have problems with some of the things I teach. I can understand. Because I'll tell you what, they're not used to it. And Peter was in the same boat. He said, look, I can't comprehend this. That God is going to save this multitude of Gentiles without us Jews. That's what Paul's message, see? And so he says, in Paul's epistles are some things hard to be understood. Even at that late date. He just couldn't comprehend it. And then he says, and which they that are unlearned and unstable, they rest or they twist, as they do also the other scriptures. And I'll tell you, people become masters at it. That's where the cults come in. They twist the scriptures. They're masters at it. And what's going to be their end result? Their destruction. Now that's hard language. Their own destruction. And so there again is what I think is perfect understanding that you can't mix all these things together and make sense out of it. It all has to be left exactly where it is. Jesus dealing with the Jew, Peter and the eleven are the apostles of the, gen, of the Jew. Paul now comes on the scene as the apostle of the Gentiles.